Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, the Lord of the banquet, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever been invited to a truly spectacular meal? A banquet is what we would call that, a fancy gathering with lots of rich and expensive foods. Or maybe if it wasn't a banquet, perhaps a dinner or an event where the people or the place that you found yourself in, you looked around and you thought to yourself, how the heck did I get here? Well, as a pastor, you may not get paid very much, but you get to know a lot of people. And so sometimes we find ourselves in situations such as this. Somebody invites us to something, and when we get there, we just look around and wonder, what the heck am I doing here? I'm out of place, but not in a bad way. So one such example is uh, my former congregation, one of our members was the daughter of a famous baseball player for the Cleveland, well, Indians at the time, now Guardians. And uh, he was a player there for a long time and a manager for a long time, Mike Hargrove. And on a Thursday night, I was sitting at my house eating my dinner, and I got a text from her husband saying, would you like to go to a baseball game? I wasn't doing anything on Friday, so I was like, sure. Little did I know that I was going to be parking in the player's parking lot and watching the game from a permanent suite that the Indians had given this guy free food and drink the whole time, right? What the heck am I doing there? How did I get into such a place? Uh, One time I uh, did a funeral uh, for a well-known man in the community, and their reception was like the nicest meal I've ever been to at a country club. And maybe you've experienced something similar when you've been invited to something that you look around and think, what am I doing here? Well, what sort of natural responses are evoked by those sorts of events? Gratitude comes to mind because you're just glad you're there, right? Because you know you didn't earn your way here. A feeling of unworthiness. And I think a careful concern not to violate the the traditions of the gathering, right? You're looking around and you're trying to see what everybody else is doing to make sure that, you know, I'm already a fish out of water. Let's not make it real obvious here. Well, there's another word that is used to describe that sort of feeling. It's humility. An event like that brings about the natural response of humility. Because you didn't earn your spot there, you were graciously invited by someone, and maybe you yourself didn't even know how big of a deal it was until you got there. And then when you do, the thought that keeps running through your mind is, how did I get here? And I'm just happy to be here. Well, our gospel reading today centers on such a banquet and the concept of humility that our Lord wishes to teach us. See, Jesus is invited to a nice dinner, and the text tells us that the person who hosted this dinner was one of the rulers of the Pharisees, right? So if you're a Pharisee, you're already a pretty well-known individual. You're in good standing with society. But if you're a ruler of the Pharisees, you are a big deal in the Jewish community. So this is not a nobody. If you get invited by this guy to come to his house, you're doing something right. You're going somewhere, you're somebody, right? So this is a big deal. It's not just a regular meal either. So we have a a, a spectacular host and and a spectacular meal. It was a Seder meal on the Sabbath. And we can tell this because in the text it says they're reclining, which is one of the specific directions given to those celebrating this meal because it represents royalty and freedom. And so when they celebrated this meal, they were meant to celebrate it as free and royal people after their slavery in Egypt. So Jesus is at this feast with this great host, and He begins to teach them a few things. The text tells us the Pharisees were watching Jesus closely. Now, this doesn't actually mean that they were really interested in what Jesus had to say. At this point, Jesus has sparred with the Pharisees a couple of times, and they're trying to make up their mind on how dangerous this guy is, how much he's going to upset the apple cart. And so they're watching him closely to make their decision about whether or not 
they need to do something about this guy. They're searching for faults and missteps that they can exploit. And in the middle of this grand gathering of important people at this wonderful meal walks in an untouchable, an unclean person, someone who would never be invited into this house for this meal, a man with dropsy, or today we call it edema, a swelling of the body because of water retention. And Jesus is not going to disappoint the Pharisees who are watching him closely. So the Pharisees are watching Jesus closely. This guy walks in and they're probably thinking, oh, here we go. What's, what's he going to do? Well, Jesus doesn't disappoint. He looks at them before he heals this guy and says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Here's their response. But they remained silent, said nothing. So he heals the man and sends him away. And then he questions their presumption again, because what he's really getting at here is they presume to know why this person is not allowed at the feast. So when he questions them again, he says, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And again, their response and they could not reply to these things. So Jesus has sparred with them about the established religious practices three times now. The first response back from Luke uh, chapter 6 is they are angry when Jesus violates their rules of the Sabbath. And Jesus then asserts that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. In chapter 13, their response to this sparring is humiliation and now silence. This represents a couple of things. One is that I think they've made up their mind about the way they see Jesus. Because very soon after our gospel reading today, they begin to seek ways to get rid of him. And number two is that they lost. They have nothing to say. They can't refute the teachings of Jesus because he is correct, of course. And at the heart of this is that these Pharisees and lawmakers reject the identity of the man they're dealing with. They think he's some teacher, some wild teacher who's trying to upset the religious establishment. They don't recognize that he is the Lord of the Sabbath, that he is the Lord of the banquet. You see, now that Jesus is in play, wherever Jesus goes, he is the host. Even if you think you invited him, that's not what happened. He came to you. He's the host. This is what we learn in the story of Mary and Martha. Even though Martha invites Jesus into her home, the mistake she makes is that once he's there, that she's the host who has to prepare things for him instead of like Mary sitting at his feet and receiving what he has come to bring. So why are they rejecting this? Why are the Pharisees afraid of Jesus? He's turning everything upside down. Everything that they know and they're comfortable with, Jesus is disrupting. Does that feel familiar? That's one of the things that people say about churches, right? They don't like to change. Well, to be fair, that's really true about everybody, right? Once we have something that we're comfortable with, we don't like changing it. And when somebody comes along who wants to, even if they might be right. Do you want to admit it to them? No. And they bother you because they're upsetting the status quo. But if Jesus is who He says He is, the Son of God, the Messiah, there's no one else in the world who would have the authority to do precisely that. There's no one else in the world who would have the knowledge and the wisdom to know precisely the way God intended us to behave towards one another. And so what he is actually doing is returning us to the way God intended things to be from the beginning. So the lawyers and the rulers of the Pharisees, they don't seem to want to get what Jesus has to say. It's not that they don't understand, it's that they don't want to receive his word. So Jesus then continues to teach them 
what the kingdom of God is like now that he is here. And so he is really pushing against their presumptions about the way we ought to gather, right? And a common theme in Luke that has come up a number of times is this, place, this takes place at the table, at the fellowship of a meal, with obvious imagery towards the altar and the table of God. And then, of course, the foretaste of the feast to come, the eschatological, the end times marriage feast of the Lamb, which has no end. So their presumptions are getting them into trouble because they're thinking they're the hosts. They set the table, they get to decide who comes to the table. And they think that all of this stuff is determined by pride and power and position. And Jesus notices that all the people who are invited, because this guy's a somebody, they're all trying to jockey each other and elbow each other to get the best spot, driven by their desire to be recognized, that they think they ought to be recognized. And so Jesus says, that's not how it goes in the kingdom of God. Let me teach you. So he says some instructions to those who are invited to the guests first, and then he'll give some instructions to the host. So for the guest, guess what? You have been invited to a wedding feast today. Did you know that? Every time you come in here and we gather around the gifts of God, you have been invited by God himself to a wedding feast. And you have no business being here nor do I. It's like that time you got invited to that unbelievable event, and you looked around and wondered, how the heck did I get here? This is so unbelievable and amazing. How is it for me? Well, it is for you because Jesus is the host. So how should we come to this feast? Well, we just did this a little bit ago. We came humbly. The first thing we do when we come into church, we remember the name into which we're baptized, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When God exalted you, when God made you who was dead in your sins alive in Jesus, that was the beginning of this unbelievable invitation to the Supper of the Lamb. And then we're reminded that today... Did we do the things that Jesus is about to teach us? No. Maybe a little bit, but not the way He wants. Did we do it free of selfishness and free of desire for manipulation? No. And so what do we do? By the grace of the Holy Spirit, we repent of those things. We humble ourselves in the presence of our host. I, a poor, miserable sinner, And what does our host do? He proceeds to exalt you to the place of honor. You who are dead in your trespasses and sins are now alive in Jesus. Did you earn your spot at the table? No. Jesus earned it on your behalf and invites you to take it. He can do that. He's the host. So he says to you, friend, come up here and sit next to me. Friend, come up here to my table and receive what I want to give you. Isn't that amazing? So really, every time we come here to church on Sunday, we should feel that way. We should feel like we're in a place we don't deserve to be that's better than we can imagine, and receiving gifts meant for people much better than us, gifts meant for Jesus Himself, and yet he gives them freely to you. That's the good news for the guest of the feast. That's the good news for us. That's why this is a rest for you. Because you can't earn anything here. Right? As we talk to the kids, we don't have anything to give to Jesus. Nothing. And yet he gives us everything. So we're at the feast and we're looking around, and wow, we're overwhelmed that we're even there, grateful, humble, and joyful that our God loves us so much that He did all this for us. 
and he continues to do so. So now Jesus turns to the host of this gathering, and he says some instructions on how one is to host others. So the Messiah is here, the rules have changed, right? So we do what he is doing for us to others. That is what he's telling us here. He wants us to be like the banquet host that Jesus is, who gives everything to those who can give him nothing in return. So we are to do the same. And he started teaching us this back in the Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6. Lend without expecting anything in return. Love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you and curse you. This is what the kingdom of God is like. In the text, he says specifically, don't invite rich people and your friends or your brothers and family members who can invite you in return and thus repay you. Instead, he says, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. How wild is that? The blessing is actually because they cannot repay you. We're beginning to act a little bit more like Jesus. By the grace of the Holy Spirit given in baptism, we begin to stumble and do these things. So how amazing do you feel that Jesus Himself has invited you to His table? That should blow you away. That should flatten you in humility. But what He's instructing us to do is extend the same sort of love and fellowship to others so that they get a little taste of what that feels like. To be invited to a place far beyond what they ever thought possible. And even if they could think of it, they never would have imagined themselves being welcomed there. And yet they are. So this emphasis on humility for the guests and the host, taught by Jesus, is to further emphasize the way things operate now that He's here. Everything is upside down. Or rather now it's been made right. So, dear friends in Christ, what do we do with this? Well, we're supposed to be continually humble. Continually humble because no matter what that untouchable person looks like who wanders into your midst, that's you. You're the same. Unlike the Pharisees, Jesus has taught us not to come to the table with presumptions that we have some other reason that we're there besides the fact that He invited us. So at his table, now we take what we experience here, out there. The law does this. The law humbles. It brings us low. It's supposed to, because if we don't, or if we aren't brought low, then we continue to look to ourselves for rescue and respite. And that only ends in disappointment and frustration and despair. But when the law brings us low, Jesus is there. And now we actually, by His grace and His Word, can see Him and, unlike the Pharisees, recognize Him for who He is. By the grace of His Word, when you gather here, you don't think that you're coming into the presence of a teacher or just a great man, but the Messiah, the Son of God, the host of the heavenly feast. He Himself has invited you. This gospel message of forgiveness, grace, and salvation, because of the love of Jesus and His work, not our own, makes us grateful, joyful, and humble. That's the only way we can live, as Jesus calls us, out there, is by receiving what He wants to give us here, because we don't generate this stuff on our own. So one... What does that look like when we go out? It looks like this. It looks like one who gives with no expectation of getting anything in return. It looks like one who associates with all kinds of people. You're not above anyone else. It looks like one who stoops to serve those who don't deserve it. After all, this is what Jesus did for us. Now, of course, Jesus does this perfectly. I hate to break it to you. You won't. Nor will I. And then we're going to come back again 
to this unbelievable feast next Sunday. And we have to say, I, a poor, miserable sinner again, prompted by God's Word, sustained in the joy of our Lord's response to that humility, that He exalts us that He forgives us of our sins, that He welcomes us to His table as His own followers, children of God. So, dear friends in Christ, go forth in humility, peace, gratitude, and offer to the best of your abilities and by the grace of God all those same things to the people God places in your life. Not so that they may look at you, but so they may see Jesus. So they may experience, just as we do when we gather around the altar for the foretaste of the feast to come, they too will experience a foretaste of what Jesus has in store for them when He invites them into His home. In the name of Jesus, amen.